Sports Tom podcast, or the STP pod for short. No politics, no drama, no arguing. Just two guys talking sports. I'm your host, JJ Peters. In today's podcast, we will discuss Week 13 NFL highlights, Ohio State versus Michigan game canceled, Mayweather will take on YouTuber Jake Paul, and much more. But before we start with um, some sports topics, we have a poll question. You can vote on every Tuesday and Thursday on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Sports Town Podcast. And the question was, who is the best team in the NFL right now, the Chiefs or Steelers? And the Chiefs won the vote at 67% to 33%. Now let's get some updates. Um, the Philadelphia Eagles have named rookie quarterback Jalen Hurts to start for this week versus the Saints. Well, it's finally happened. The Eagles have named Jalen Hurts starting quarterback over Carson Wentz according to Philadelphia coach Doug Peterson. He confirmed the news on the Eagles' website. The news was officially announced by ESPN NFL insider Adam Schefter. On Sunday the pa- uh, on Sunday versus the Packers, Carson Wentz was benched in favor of rookie second-round pick Jalen Hurts. Hurts came into the game and threw a touchdown pass that had more passing errors than Wentz. He also gave the Eagles a much-needed boost. The former North Dakota State product has struggled this season and has more turnovers than touchdowns this season. Hurts, who finished second in the Heisman last year, will get his first start on Sunday versus the NFC-leading Saints. Currently, the Eagles are 3-8-1 and one or in third in the abysmal NFC East. Sergio Perez of Team Racing Point wins the Secure Grand Prix. This was Perez's first Formula One Grand Prix after taking him 190 times to win. The 30-year-old got his first win with Team Racing Point, despite not maybe having a car next season. No word yet on who he will sign with next season. Perez is from Mexico, and with the win, he is currently in fourth in the Formula One settings for 2020. He will finish the uh, Formula One will finish the 2020 season this Sunday at Abu Dhabi. Lewis Hamilton is still not sure if he will be able to race for Team Mercedes after testing positive for coronavirus last week. The New York Jets have fired defensive coordinator Greg Williams after losing to the Ra- Raiders with just four seconds left to play on, the, on Sunday. It was first reported by NFL Network insider Tom Pelissaro and CBS Sports NFL insider Jason Lockavore. Williams decided to blitz and leave wide receiver Henry Diggs or Henry Ruggs one-on-one with rookie cornerback undrafted free agent Lamar Jackson. Not Lamar Jackson for the Ravens, Lamar Jackson for the Jets, who was from Nebraska. Williams, who is not known for playing, or was not known for playing prevent defense and blitzing a majority of the time. Defensive assistant Frank Bush will be the interim defensive coordinator for the rest of the year. The Jets are now 0-12 and currently have the number one pick for next year's draft in April. Even safety Marcus May questioned Williams' call, and every and even other players did not agree with his call to blitz with just seconds left to play. In 2018, he was the interim coach in Cleveland after Hugh Jackson was fired by the Browns in the middle of the season. Number 13th ranked Wisconsin versus 25th ranked Louisville will not be played on Wednesday because of multiple positive COVID tests within the Louisville program. Louisville had to cancel their game last Friday versus UNC Greensboro because certain players and staff members tested positive for coronavirus. Louisville just became ranked 25th in the newest AP rankings. And Wisconsin fell from 4th to the 13th after getting beat by Marquette in the closing seconds. No word yet on if this game will be rescheduled as part of the Big Ten ACC Challenge. Former Philly Cardinal Dodger White Sox and Athletic Dick Allen passed away at the age of 78 on Monday, December 7th. The Philadelphia Phillies announced the passing of the legend Dick Allen on their social media accounts. Allen was a seven-time All-Star, two-time home run leader, RBI leader, rookie of the year, and MVP in 1972. Allen played for 15 seasons in the MLB. He had 351 homers, batted an, his batting average was 292, and had 1,119 RBIs in his career. Unfortunately, with how good Dick Allen was in the majors, he has yet to be enshrined at Cooperstown. He would have likely been on the ballot this season if it weren't because of the coronavirus. Many baseball analysts believe Allen will be selected to the Baseball Hall of Fame in 2021. Houston, we have some more problems. James Harden is yet to report to the Rockets training camp. On December 1st, the Houston Rockets began training camp, and Harden has not even been in Houston. Reportedly, James Harden still wants to be traded to Brooklyn, be paired up with Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant. First-year head coach Steven Silas states Harden will report to training camp when he is ready. Unfortunately, the preseason starts on December 11th when they take on the Chicago Bulls. Multiple fans from Houston are not happy with James Harden because of the wild offseason. The 2017-2018 NBA, NBA League MVP wants out of Houston immediately despite the Rockets trading for John Wall, getting rid of Russell Westbrook, and signing DeMarcus Cousins. 
Six-time All-Pro Zach Martin will be out three weeks with a calf injury. According to ESPN's Todd Archer, Zach Martin has been placed on the injured reserve and will miss multiple weeks and possibly the season if the Cowboys don't have a chance to make the postseason by week 16. The six-time Pro Bowl injured his calf versus the Washington football team on Thanksgiving Day. The former 2014 first-round pick is considered to be the best offensive guard in the NFL and maybe the best O-lineman in the league. This could be the first time in his career that Martin will miss being an All-Pro and Pro Bowler. The year has been a struggle for the Cowboys, and they're currently last place in the awful NFC least at 3-8. The Dallas Cowboys played the Baltimore Ravens on Tuesday night. The scandal with the University of Louisville, Adidas, and Brian Bowen's family continues. The NCAA released a statement saying that Louisville should have known that Adidas gave $100,000 to Brian Bowen's family to attend the University of Louisville in 2017. Louisville basketball was charged with one level one violation and three level two violations. Rick Pitino was the head coach of Louisville at the time and is now the head coach at the University of Iona. According to the NCAA, Adidas did that with other recruits as well. The University of Louisville released the, released the inv- inv- <laughs> investigation would not end until some time next year. The rest of the inv- in- investigation, excuse me, I'm having a problem saying that word, will be handled by the NCAA Committee on Fractions or the Independent Accountability Resol- Resolution Process. The University of Louisville has denied the charge the NCAA is accusing them of another week of college football was successful college football weekend december 6th had some interesting games to say the least coastal carolina took down byu oregon fell to california stanford shocked washington and rice at their biggest upset since 1996 when they beat rival marshall the top three teams in the college football playoff rankings alabama notre dame and clemson all won on saturday we will talk about all it all this in the very segment who looked better, Clemson or Alabama? Well, both teams looked good, but man, Alabama just destroyed LSU. Won 55 17. Mac Jones continually putting himself in the Heisman conversation. Devontae Smith had over 200 yards in the first half. People are considering him to be a top 10 pick in next year's draft. That's crazy. A lot of people say he's the best prospect coming into in the 2021 draft. And then you look at what LSU went from basically hero to zero. They were the best team in football last year. And this year, they just completely fell apart. Again, you you went 14-0 and last year. Or actually, no, I'm sorry. They went 15-0 and last year. They had the best quarterback. They just had the best offense. They lose a bunch, but then they go from hero to zero. And you just it's so weird because most of the time, teams that win the championship game, like Alabama or Clemson, they return the next year are really good. But, man, LSU has gone completely – Terrible, similar to what Auburn did a few years ago back in 2011. And Gene Chizik basically got two years, and that was it. So I would price Alabama look better because Clemson, they struggled against Virginia Tech, especially at the end of the first half. Virginia Tech was one yard away from tying the game up. Then they got Trevor Lawrence to throw an interception. Then they turned the ball over themselves, and that's kind of when Clemson flexed their muscles. But, yeah, Clemson didn't didn't look quite as good as Alabama, and they destroyed a rival. And those are supposed to be good games, even when LSU or Alabama is not very good. But, um, yeah, I would say Alabama looked the best. Uh, did Coastal Carolina get a good ranking in the third edition of the college football playoff ranking? In my opinion, no. I think they were a little low. I think it should have been 11th or 12th at least. But I'm kind of happy they went to 13th because I was afraid they'd only go from 16 or 15. And them and BYU kind of switched because BYU went down to 18th. Um, so I'm glad with that. I think they're a little low because I'm not sure they're a top 10 team, but they're better than 13. So I'd probably put them at 11, but I'm still glad the college football playoff ranking kind of recognized him, even though they won't ever be able to take part in the college football playoff just because they're not that big name. And it just, it basically happened with UCF a few years ago. And it just, that's how the committee is going to work unless they move it to 18 playoff, which they're not going to in, in the near future. Um, reaction to the third edition of the 2020 college football playoff ranking, the top six, remain the same and Iowa State jumps up to number seven. Coastal Carolina goes to 13 as we just mentioned after beating BYU and Wisconsin falls out of the rankings which is really shocking because they just lost to Indiana. Indiana had their backup quarterback but Indiana has a pretty good football team this year but Wisconsin they are completely out of the rankings and it looks like their chances of making the a Big Ten championship game are still are not there's not there's not a chance because Northwestern looks like they're going to get it. So, uh, Wisconsin, not the season they wanted, um, especially with them having so many games canceled. You got to feel sorry for Paul Chris because he's done an excellent job with that program. But, you know, maybe next year is what the Cubs fans always say. And last but not least, um, Heisman front runners. A lot of people are telling me Kyle Trask, but I mean, I just got 
put Justin Fields in there. I know Fields is similar to Lawrence. People have always said that, well, you know, why aren't you, you think Trevor, or Justin Fields is so good. Why don't you feel, or why don't you think um, Trevor, or, uh, Trevor Lawrence is good? And I kind of ponder that question, but you look at um, guys like Justin Fields, he wasn't able to really control that. And he's played all games that he's played all five games the last day has played. So I think he definitely deserves to be a conversation. I know we didn't really have that game. Um, that Heisman, he didn't have the Heisman moment, but like, when did really Kyle Trask have it? And basically, if there was a Heisman moment, Mac Jones showed on Saturday. I know it's LSU this year, but man, he was really good. So I think Mac Jones has a bit as, as good of a chance to win the Heisman as Kyle Trask does. And then, you know, Zach Wilson was doing pretty good for BYU, but after losing to Coastal Carolina, didn't perform very well. I think he's kind of taken himself out of the running. Um, let's switch gears now to boxing. Uh, Logan Paul taking on Floyd Mayweather Jr. Another Paul brother will be getting in the ring this February. Logan Paul, the older brother of Jake Paul, will be fighting former boxer Floyd Mayweather Jr. Mayweather finished his career at 50-0 with 27 knockouts. He was a former super featherweight, lightweight, light welterweight, welterweight, and light middleweight champion. He also earned a bronze medal at the 1996 Olympic Games in Atlanta, Georgia. One of his biggest wins came by beating former champion Manny Pacquiao back in 2015. Mayweather has also fought former UFC lightweight and pound-for-pound champion Conor McGregor in a technical knockout that lasted 10 rounds. However, the fight was an exhibition. Jake Paul, on the other hand, is 0-1 and lost to other YouTube sensation KSI and split decision back in 2018. He fought KSI again in 2019 at Staples Center, and at this time, it was a draw. The fight will take place on February 20th, and the event and the where they're supposed to box is still not known. Um, let's get to our first question. Is this a good idea for Logan Paul? I don't think so, because Logan Paul is not a professional boxer. Um, he's just an amateur uh, Floyd Mayweather Jr. is a boxer. He's been boxing all his life. Yes, he's retired. Yes, he's smarter than Logan Paul. But I mean, it's Floyd Mayweather Jr. He's going to probably, he's going to beat up on Logan Paul a little bit, in my opinion. I don't think this lasts very long. It's not a good idea now. However, Logan Paul can make even more money. He makes a million dollars, it seems like, like, like nothing. But I, I mean, they're going to make a lot of money. I'm not sure how much. But, I mean, he's going to get embarrassed. And a lot of people are saying Floyd Mayweather is just doing this to avenge the loss of when Nate Robinson lost um, to his younger brother, Jake Paul. But, uh, yeah, I don't think this is a good idea for Logan Paul if you take the money out. I know he's going to make a lot of money, but I think he's going to get embarrassed. Um, how many rounds does the fight last? Well, it depends how many fights or rounds they do. Do they do a normal 12-round fight? Do they do eight rounds? Do they do 10 rounds? If they do a full 12 rounds, I say it lasts – Three or four rounds. Uh, Floyd Mayweather. Uh, yeah, I'm going to say three or four rounds. Floyd Mayweather knocks him out in technical knockout. I mean, again, Logan Paul stands no chance against Floyd Mayweather Jr. I mean, he's a boxer. I know. I understand what Logan Paul is trying to do. But, I mean, Floyd Mayweather is a boxer. Like, he's a professional boxer. He will destroy Floyd May or destroy Logan Paul. So, again, I know there's he's making a lot of money. I can see that. But, I mean, you don't want to get embarrassed on live TV. Um, now let's go to some college football, which we already talked about, but this time it's some bad news. Um, Ohio State versus Michigan has been canceled. Well, Kirk, Kirk Herbstreit was right. One of the biggest rivalries in college football will not be played. This means Ohio State is not eligible for the Big Ten championship game unless the conference changes their mind. Indiana will be the team to replace the Buckeyes if they're not eligible to play at Lucas Oil Stadium on December 19th. Currently, Indiana is the second-best team in the Big Ten and would face Northwestern in the Big Ten championship game. Well, this is why the Big Ten made the mistake of waiting so long to start a season. If they would have started a season like the ACC and the SEC and the Pat and the Big 12, they would have been able – Ohio State would have been able to at least play seven or eight games. They would have been able to qualify the championship game. The Big Ten is going to find some way to put, big, uh, to put Ohio State into the – uh, Big Ten championship game so they can show to the college football playoff. But even if they don't, I feel like the college football playoff committee already has the eye test and they already see that Ohio State is Ohio State and they've looked good whom they, who they played. So I think this is a this is the reason why the Big Ten should have uh, should have, you know, had built in bias and started the season a lot earlier. 
But I don't know if this is really going to hurt Ohio State's chances because I still think they're making the college football playoff because of the eye test. But Indiana Northwestern doesn't seem like a bad championship game, but I feel like Ohio Indiana will win that game. Um, and this, again, brings me to my next question. Will this affect Ohio State's chance of making the college football playoff? It might, but I don't think it's going to because, again, the Ohio State, it's through the eye test. You can't really put any, te- any other team over them. I mean, Florida's going to have two losses because they're going to lose to Alabama. Texas A&M, you could put them in there. I mean, Cincinnati's a team that I think they're really disrespecting. They went down from seven to eight. They're not going to have a game this week. So, I mean, they're kind of screwed right now as well. Um, I could see them. I, mean, I would love to see Cincinnati. In, and this and this is, again, why they need to move go from four to eight, at least for just this year. It's too late because, again, the college football, play, their college football runs at a snail's pace. Like what Dan Patrick said, the host of the Dan Patrick show. But, man, this is why they should have went to the A-team because Cincinnati has a chance. Maybe you put Coastal Carolina in there. But I don't think this affects Ohio State chances just because they're Ohio State. And when we've seen them play, they've basically conquered every team and destroyed them in the process. Um, and then also, how does this affect Justin Fields' Heisman chance? I think it affects it all greatly because you saw how much it affected just our Trevor Lawrence's after he missed two games. And now Justin Fields only going to play five games. He didn't look that impressive when he played against Indiana. So that kind of that kind of has him probably not going to the ceremony, which is not going to be technically New York. I think it's going to be through a Zoom call. And that kind of stinks for him, but I definitely think he's getting disrespected because when he does play, he is the best, one of the best quarterbacks in college football. And to me, to be honest, I think he's better than Trevor Lawrence, just what I've seen from Justin Fields. But again, we'll see what happens, but I think this basically takes him out of the running um, for the Heisman, unfortunately. Um, College basketball week two, week two of the college basketball season happened and there were a few upsets. However, the best game of the week and maybe the year was not played. Number one, Gonzaga was supposed to play number two, Baylor, but the game was canceled because of some positive COVID tests and uncertainties. If there were enough players on each side to play. We mentioned on Tuesday's podcast that eighth ranked Michigan State beat sixth ranked Duke 75-69. Seventh ranked Kansas outlasted number 20th ranked Kentucky 65-62. And for the first time in John Calipari's era as the head coach at Kentucky, they are one in three, one of the worst starts and even in program history. So it's just unbelievable. And they dropped out of the rankings, of course. Uh, 17th ranked Texas beats 14th ranked North Carolina, 69-67. And Marquette stunned 4th ranked Wisconsin, 76-65 on the last second putback that had the Badgers lose their first game of the 2020-21 season. Unfortunately, there were more than a few cancellations for COVID, but all I can say is we're in a wild ride for college basketball this season. Biggest upsets of last week. Well, I mean, Marquette, Taking down Wisconsin is a pretty big upset. And even though Michigan State was ranked eighth to beat Duke, who's supposed to be really good this year, not as good as they've been in years past, but they're supposed to be good. They played very well. Um, I was really hoping Gonzaga and Baylor would play. They didn't. Um, Texas beating UNC is kind of a is kind of an upset, but man, Wisconsin losing to Marquette. And I thought Marquette was better than not being ranked, but uh, what Marquette did in the last play was unbelievable. Getting that tip back, you know, uh, sad for uh, sad for Wisconsin fans, but man, Marquette played well. Those highlights, I mean, what they were able to do in that last play of the game was excellent. Uh, biggest upsets of la or actually we already said that. I'm sorry. Um, how disappointed were you when Baylor versus Gonzaga was canceled? I was extremely disappointed because that was going to be the game of the year so far. And that looked like it was a Final Four matchup or even a championship matchup. Of course, we didn't see it. But what I did, I was watching, I think it was Illinois Baylor on Wednesday or Thursday. I can't remember. It might have been Tuesday. It was last week sometime. Baylor looked very, looked very good. They struggled a little bit, but then they came back well. Jared Butler is a very good player. In my opinion, he's in the top five for college basketball player of the year. But, yes, I was very extremely disappointed. I was so disappointed that I was ready to, you know, watch the game and it doesn't happen. So that's really disappointing, but uh, I was very, very disappointed. And then of course, last but not least for the college basketball, who is the college basketball player of the year? And what would, uh, who is at the top right now? Well, of course, Luca Garza out of Iowa is probably number one. I would probably say Jalen Suggs from Gonzaga's two, Jared Butler from Baylor three, Remy Martin from Arizona state four. And then I'd probably put Cade Cunningham at five. Uh, Luca Garza is very good. Um, again, he ha- what we uh, what I have seen from him is very good. Now he's they haven't played anybody yet at the moment, 
They will, but we'll see how good Luca Garza is then. I'm surprised he didn't enter the NBA draft. He probably could have. I don't know his really status. I think he was projected to go in the first round, but it looks like he made the right decision right now. And of course, you can't sleep on guys like Jalen Suggs, who had a scary injury, but came back. Um, you can't sleep on guys like Jared Butler and Cade Cunningham. They're very good. We'll see what happens. We have a lot of college basketball to be played, but again, it's going to be a wild ride. Last but certainly not least, we dive into all the big games of Week 13 in the NFL. There's a lot of action and some big upsets. Let's get started. The Cleveland Browns traveled to Nashville, Tennessee to take on the front runners in the AFC South, the Tennessee Titans. Both the Browns and Titans were 8-3 and three and looking to get closer to clinching a playoff berth. However, early on, Tennessee did not look ready to win or ready at all, and the Browns took advantage of it. Baker Mayfield would throw four touchdown passes in the first half to have the Browns with a 38-7 lead going into the break. They eventually would end up sealing the deal 41-35. Mayfield would throw 25 of 33 for 334 yards. Jarvis Landry would also score a touchdown on a two-yard pass from Baker Mayfield. Derrick Henry had a rare fumble, and Donovan Peoples-Jones would have another touchdown pass from Baker Mayfield. Nick Chubb had an eight, had eight yards rushing on 18 carries. Rashard Higgins had 95 yards receiving on six receptions and one touchdown. For the Titans, Ryan Tannehill threw for 389 yards, three touchdowns, and one pick. Derrick Henry struggled for his standards, and he would only rush for 60 yards. Corey Davis, the former first-round pick at 11 catches for 182 yards receiving and one touchdown. The Raiders traveled to the Meadowlands to take on the winless Jets from New York. Vegas was trying to forget about their tough loss to the Vegas, on our tough loss to the Falcons. On the other hand, the Jets were just trying to get their first win of the 2020 campaign. The Jets started off the game very quickly and took a 7-0 lead. Vegas would then take a 13-7 lead and at one time a 24-13 lead. But here come the Jets. They would get two touchdowns and a two-point conversion and had a 28-24 lead with just seconds left to play. But in Jets fashion, they would all-out blitz, and Derrick Henry would find first-round pick Henry Ruggs in the end zone for the go-ahead touchdown. The Las Vegas Raiders hold on to beat or come back to beat the Jets 31-28. But look on the bright side, Jets fans. You still have the number one pick and the sweepstakes for Trevor Lawrence. Derek Carr for the Raiders was 28 of 47 for 381 yards, three touchdown passes, and one interception. Deontay Booker filling in for Josh Jacobs had 50 yards rushing on 16 carries. And Darren Waller was a beast with 13 receptions for 200 yards and two touchdowns. Sam Darnold was 14 of 23 for 186 yards and two touchdowns. Ty Johnson had a great game with 104 yards rushing on 22 carries and one score. Jamison Crowder had five receptions for 47 yards and two scores. The Dolphins were trying to keep their playoff hopes alive, and the Bengals were just trying to play spoiler. Tua got the start and was hoping to get Miami to their eighth win of the season. Brandon Allen early on would throw an interception, but the Dolphins could not take advantage. However, there were a few fights that happened in the game before and after. In fact, it was so severe that five players were ejected that included Dolphins wide receiver Devontae Parker, cornerback Xavier Howard, Bengals wide receiver T. Higgins, Bengals safety Sean Williams, and Dolphins Matt Collins. The main reason was because in the quarter, in the second quarter, Bengals' Mike Thomas had an unnecessary hit on Dolphins wide receiver Jakeem Grant. Even Miami's head coach, Brian Flores, got into the mix. The Dolphins would hold on or would come back to beat the Bengals 19-7 despite trailing 7-0 early. Tua Tungavaloa would get a one-touchdown pass of the game. He would. They would also grab two field goals. He would throw 26 of 39 for 296 yards. Miles Gaskin had rushed for 90 yards on 21 carries. Mike Kosicki had 88 yards receiving and one touchdown. For the Bengals, Brandon Allen had 153 yards passing on 11 of 19 attempts, one touchdown and one interception. Giovanna, Giovanni Bernard had 30 yards on 12 carries, and Tyler Boyd had one catch for 72 yards. The Bengals' only score of the game came from him. The Minnesota Vikings were trying to get their fifth win in the last six games and trying to get a 500 for the first time this season. The Jags had lost 10 straight up to this point after upsetting the Colts in week one. The game was a lot closer than most fans for the Vikings or any fans in the NFL wanted to see. The Jags opened up the game with a 28-yard touchdown pass from Mike Lynn to give Jacksonville an early 6-0 lead. At one time, they had a 9-0 lead, but here comes Minnesota. They would score 
but they'd miss the extra point and they would continually start scoring and take an early 20 or take an early 21 16 or take a 19 16 lead but thanks to a safety they'd go up by five but here come the jaguars they tied the game and the closing seconds they would get and force overtime but on the first possession they would throw an interception that would lead to the go-ahead field goal by dan bailey final score the vikings 27 the jaguars 24 Kirk Cousins was 28 of 43 for 305 yards, three touchdown passes, and one interception. Dalvin Cook rushed for 120 yards on 32 carries, and the rookie Justin Jefferson, Offensive Rookie of the Year candidate, had nine receptions for 121 yards and another touchdown. Mike Lennon was 28 of 42 for 280 yards, one touchdown, and two interceptions. Josh Robinson rushed for 78 yards on 18 carries and one touchdown. Callan Johnson led the way for the Jags with 86 yards receiving on four receptions. The battle for the AFC South continued as the Indianapolis Colts took on the rival, the Houston Texans. The Colts were just trying to stay in the playoff race or were trying to stay in the playoff race while the Texans were just trying to remain competitive and maybe a chance to play in the postseason. Phillip Rivers got his chance, in the, got his chance to play and he threw for 285 yards on 27 of 35 passes and two touchdowns. The game would go somewhat back and forth and at one time the Colts had a 24-20 lead going to half. They would get a 26-20 lead thanks to a safety. But at the end, Houston was driving and could have scored and upset the Colts, but Deshaun Watson would fumble the handoff. The Colts would recover, and the game was history. Jonathan Taylor for the Colts had 91 yards on 13 carries. T.Y. held 110 yards receiving on six receptions and one touchdown as well. Deshaun Watson was 26-38 for 341 yards and one interception. He also fumbled. David Johnson rushed for 44 yards and one touchdown. We switched from the AFC South to the NFC South. AFC leading New Orleans Saints led by Taysom Hill at quarterback. The Falcons are 4-7 and seven and have won their last three of the four and were coming off a big win versus the Las Vegas Raiders. Taysom Hill threw his first ever touchdown pass in the first quarter as he would find wide receiver Traquan Smith. He would find another touchdown pass to Jared Cook. He had two touchdown passes in the game for his first in his career. Alvin Kamara would get a rushing touchdown to go up 21-9, and the Falcons would get a touchdown from Matt Ryan to Russell Gage to trim the lead, but could not win. The final score, the Saints would hold on to win 21-16. Alvin Kamara had 89 yards on 15 carries and one touchdown. Michael Thomas had nine receptions for 105 yards. Matt Ryan was 19-39 of for 273 yards and one touchdown. The reeling Arizona Cardinals hoped to get back to their winning ways as they hosted the NFC West rival, the L.A. Rams. On the opening drive of the game, the Cardinals would strike early. Kyler Murray would find Dan Arnold to make it 7-0. But the Rams would score 17 unanswered points to make it a 17-7 lead going into the third quarter. Kyler Murray would find the end zone as he would find his number one target, DeAndre Hopkins. But after that, the Rams would control the game, including getting an interception by Troy Hill that sealed the win for the Rams. The final score of the LA Rams, 38, the Arizona Cardinals, 28. Jared Goff was 37 of 47 for 351 yards, one touchdown. Cam Akers had 72 yards on the ground and one touchdown. And Robert Woods at 85 yards receiving. Kyler Murray was 21 of 39 for 173 yards, three touchdowns, and one interception. Kenyon Drake had 10 carries, 49 yards, and one touchdown. Dan Earl, the tight end, had two receptions for 61 yards and one touchdown. The New England Patriots traveled to the beautiful SoFi Stadium with no fans to take on the struggling Chargers. The Patriots DC needed one more win to have a chance at the playoffs. Despite having a quarterback that threw for less than 70 yards, they would dominate the Chargers. They won 45 0. Ironic after or ironic before the Sunday's game, Anthony Lynn told his player, Well, the season is pretty much over for us and we have no chance to make the postseason. I think that that got, that, that got to the Chargers. The New England Patriots had a 29 0 lead at half. Justin Herbert struggles as he threw two picks and only had 26 completion on 53 pass attempts. Devin Harris had an 80 yards on the ground for the New England. And he also, and Austin Eckler for the Chargers had 36 yards on eight rushing attempts. Keenan Allen had five receptions for 48 yards. Don't look now, but the Patriots are now 500 and have a chance to make the postseason. And it seems evident that head coach Anthony Lynn will be fired when the season is over or right before it. Another game and another dub for the Green Bay Packers. The Eagles traveled to Green Bay and tried to make it a game versus the NFC North leading Patriots. They tried their best, but at the end of the day, Green Bay just flexed their muscles and won by 14. 
But the game wasn't, that wasn't the big story. Jalen Hurts came in for Carson Wentz finally as Carson Wentz was benched. Jalen Hurts threw for more yards than Carson Wentz and threw for 109 yards and one touchdown pass. However, he did throw an INT. Jalen Rager, the rookie draft pick, would get a 672-yard kickoff return, which at the time trimmed the lead to six points. But Aaron Jones, 77-yard, or 70, yeah, 77-yard rushing touchdown would seal the deal for the pack. Aaron Rodgers, well, he didn't have one, but he did have a solid game. He finished the game with three touchdown passes, 295 yards, and was 25 of 34. Devontae Adams had 121 yards, and guess what? He had two more touchdowns to add to his collection. D- Jalen Hurts had 109 yards passing, as we mentioned, one touchdown and one interception. Miles Sanders had 31 yards on 10 carries, and Dallas Goddard had 66 yards on five receptions. The NFC West the leading Seattle Seahawks hosted the New York Giants on Sunday. And by the way, at this time, the New York Giants were somehow leading the division at four and seven. Well, the Giants decided to play Colt McCoy, their backup quarterback, to replace an injured Daniel Jones. Well, it seemed to work because they somehow upset the Seattle Seahawks 17-12 and had a 14-5 lead at one point. Wayne Gallman was solid. He had 135 yards and 16 carries, and Evan Ingram finally showed up with four receptions for 32 yards. Colt McCoy was a 13 of 22 for 105 yards, one touchdown, and one interception. Russell Wilson might have taken himself out of the MVP race after he threw only 263 yards on 27 of 43, one touchdown, and one interception. Chris Carson rushed for 65 yards and 13 carries, and a rising superstar DK Metcalf at 80 yards on five receptions. The Kansas City Chiefs had a scare on Sunday night. The undisputed, undisputed defending Super Bowl champions hosted the rival Denver Broncos and looked very wounded on Sunday night football. The Broncos were able to ground and pound and use clock, not turn the ball over, and get one or two punts from the Chiefs. They had a 10-9 lead and were shutting the Chiefs down when they got inside the 20-yard line. The Chiefs would get a few point, few field goals, and eventually it would seal the deal for them. They would hold on to a 22-16 win after officially ending the game with an interception from Drew Locke. The Chiefs were able to also get a lot of, get two turnovers from Drew Locke. He did, however, throw for a, a 318, or not 318, so I was, that was uh, Patrick Mahomes. He did, however, throw for a modest 151 yards and two touchdowns and two interceptions. Melvin Gordon rushed for 131 yards on 15 carries, and Noah Fan had 57 yards receiving on four catches. Patrick Mahomes was 25 of 40 for 318 and one touchdown. Well, I think he right now is the safe bet for MVP. Le'Veon Bell rushed 40 yards, 11 carries, and Travis Kelsey had 136 yards receiving on eight receptions and added one score. The undefeated Pittsburgh Steelers hosted the Washington football team on Monday Night Football. It's been a strange year, as now we're starting to see Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and guess what? We'll even see a Friday game on Thanksgiving. It's been a crazy game. I think I'm somehow, or crazy year. I think I'm somehow getting used to it. Washington was a massive underdog, but somehow the football team without even a name would go out and beat the Pittsburgh Steelers and the Steelers would suffer their first loss. After the game was over, the Dolphins were popping champagne and remained the only undefeated team in National Football League history. The Steelers jumped out to a 14-0 lead at early, but here comes Washington. They end up sealing the deal 23-17 thanks to getting a late interception by Big Ben. Alex Smith was 31 of 46 for 296 yards and one touchdown. Just give that man the comeback player of the year. Logan Thomas, who was be- slowly becoming Alex Smith's favorite target, had nine receptions for 98 yards and one touchdown. By the way, Logan Thomas was a former quarterback at Virginia Tech. And Peyton Barber rushed for 23 yards on 14 carries. Roethlisberger would throw for 305 yards, two touchdowns, and one interception. He threw over 50 times, and they did. The Steelers did drop the ball seven times. Anthony McFarland, filling in for all the injured running backs for the Steelers, had 15 yards on four carries. James Washington had two receptions for 80 yards and one touchdown. The 8-3 Bills took on their injury-prone 5-6 and six Niners, who were now playing in Glendale, Arizona, instead of Santa Clara because of the band on four. Unfortunately, in Santa Clara, the 49ers are not allowed to play because of no contact sports for the next three weeks. Well, the 49ers showed promise as they would get two big stops by the Ni- Bills and would get a dry, or would open the game with a touchdown and make it 7-0. But at the end of the day, the Bills were just the better football team. They flexed their muscles and won 34-24. 
It's just not the Niners' year. Yeah, they still have a chance to make the playoffs, but there's been so many injuries that include George Kittle, Jimmy Garoppolo, Nick Boza, and even guys like Richard Sherman and Fred Warner battled injury. And on top of that, they traded their best linebacker. So, again, it's not been a great season. Josh Allen threw four touchdown passes. He was also 32 of 40 for 375 yards. Devin Singletary had 18 carries for 61 yards. And Cole Beasley led the way in receiving for the Bills with 130 yards on nine catches and added one score. For the Niners, Nick Mullins is a good quarterback, but he's not a great quarterback. And the reason why, he was 26 of 39 for 316 yards, three touchdowns, but he did throw two INTs. Jeff Wilson was back and had 47 yards and seven carries. And Brandon Ayuk had five receptions for 95 yards and one touchdown. Last but not least, the Cowboys versus the Ravens. The Baltimore Ravens are looking to end their three-game losing streak versus the Cowboys on Tuesday Night Football. The Dallas Cowboys were hoping to stay in the thick of things in the atrocious NFC East. Lamar Jackson, the running MVP, would return for the Ravens after testing positive for COVID-19 on Thanksgiving night. Well, it started a little slow as Lamar Jackson threw an interception to start the game that the Cowboys would drive for a field goal. But the next possession, he would get a 37-yard touchdown pass on a fourth and two, and then he would find Miles Boykin in the end zone for the first time this season, or for the first time in three weeks, and they had a 14-10 lead, and they never looked back. They would eventually win the game 34-17 thanks, for, thanks to Lamar Jackson throwing for two throwing two touchdown passes, one to Marquise Brown, the other one to Miles Boykin, and having a rushing touchdown. He also threw 170, 170 yards and had a one, and as we all know, he had one rushing touchdown. Gus Edwards led the way for Baltimore with seven carries for 101 yards, and Marquise Brown had five receptions, 39 yards, and one touchdown. Andy Dalton had a nice game and threw for 285 yards, two touchdowns, and one reception, and was marvelously only sacked one time. Zeke rushed for 77 yards on 16 carries, and Marcus Gallup had seven receptions for 86 yards and one touchdown. Thanks for listening to the Sports Town Podcast, or the STP Pod for short. You can find us on Anchor, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and much more. We release new episodes every Wednesday and Friday. Also, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Sports Town Podcast. If you want to check out more videos of the Sports Down Podcast, click on the left. If you want to subscribe to the channel, click on the right.